Hi, okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you could just all kick off by um, introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about your personal experience with the Plants Plan. <laughs> um, maybe Catherine, can we start with you? Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm six months and three weeks post the Belong Transplant and eight years post the liver transplant. <laughs> So I'll pass you to John. Uh, yeah, hi, afternoon, I'm John. Um, I'm 43 CF and 20 years post double lung transplant. So, wow. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, Kim. Yeah, I'm Kim and I'm 33 and I've been waiting for a uh, corporate transplant for about a month now. So I've been on the transplant list about a month. Fantastic, thank you all. And Catherine, can you tell us a little bit about um, your your experiences with transplant and, and your personal take on the situation in, in your experience? Yeah. Basically, um, I was quite well as a young child. Um, early teenage years, started to have issues with my liver. Got put on the list at 14, started MG feeding, then taken off. Um, then went really downhill at the age of about 17, swelled up to from a size 8 to a size 20 with retention of fluid and looked like a Simpson and then got my transplant, uh, yeah it was a very <coughs> strange experience, whereas my lungs, um, I was listed for three years, was listed originally because one of the doctors basically said to me how do you want to die? And I told him, don't be stupid, I'm not dying yet. So, got put on the list. Um, yeah, four false alarms, and finally on the fifth one, I got my new bones. And that was at Christmas, just fun. Incredible. And, and John, your experience is <coughs> in a similar vein. How, how was the experience for you? Uh, yeah, mine was, I, I've never really come across anyone had the same kind of experience as me. I think... Um, I was very healthy up until I was about 16, but at 13 I lost two close friends within a short piece of time and that <coughs> gave me into taking it very seriously, um, which meant I kind of cut myself off from social life completely in order to just look after myself. By the time I was about 18 I was starting to get ill, going to the hospital every one or two months. Uh, by the time I was 20, so like that, 20, I was in hospital pretty much two weeks in, two weeks out. Uh, so I got put on the tripod list, um, and uh, I was waiting a year. Uh, I had the tripod when I was 23, I had four <coughs> false alarms and got my tripod on the fifth call. Uh, all very kind of bizarre, very overwhelming um, but I think for me it was just a natural progression of that's what I've been aiming towards for 10 years so this kind of went with the flow and it's like just took it as it went. And Kim then for you as someone <coughs> on, on the list how did it hearing some experiences of, of people who've been through this process and having false alarms and how, how do you feel about what's ahead for you? Um, obviously it's quite a, a, um, a scary time, it's going into the unknown I suppose, um, you know, your whole life is in somebody else's hands and you've got to trust that team to know when you're ready to go for that transplant, <clears throat> to make that assessment of your health situation. Um, obviously I've got other friends as well that I've seen go through the transplant process um, and it's it's you know it's very scary but it's it's very um, you know to see them come out the other end and be living their lives in a certain way um, that they couldn't do before transplant is just amazing um, you know they wouldn't have had that chance if they hadn't have got those those organs so you know, they're living their lives and they wouldn't be here now. 
same as you guys, you might not be here now um, if you hadn't had that transplant. So, you know, we're all sat there talking to us and, you know, I've got two children and I would love to think that, you know, I've got 20 years, where, you know, to see them grow up and, you know, so it is good to see, to see you guys, you know, that are at the other side of it and it gives you a bit of hope, yeah. And I guess it leads quite nicely on to the statistics that were released recently, which says that 80% 80 of people do feel that organ donation is a good thing, but there's only 40% 40 40 of people, although willing, haven't actually signed the organ donor register or perhaps had those conversations. Um, how does that make you all feel and you know what do you think we can be doing differently to try and change some of that? I do think people need educating more. It's the fear of the unknown with transplant. It's thinking oh they're going to chop you up into little pieces when you die. Well no it doesn't work like that. I think as well um, that what I've come across because I do try and talk about it quite a lot uh, with people is they don't like to think about the end of their life, so they would rather not think about that, and that's that's understandable. For us, it's in our lives, so we have to think about that. Um, but for, for normal people that are healthy, they don't have to think that you know about the end of their life and what might happen to them. So it's understandable that they don't want to think like that. But we need to kind of say that it's okay to talk about that and it's not a terrible thing to speak about, you know? I think Kim just hit it now in the head person speaking. I think um, from my point of view, it was, I mean that's exactly what I think. I think because we live it day in, day out, we see it, we, we think about it and again from the age of, I mean I say 13 but even beyond that, before I was 10 years old, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to die one day. Yeah. Um, and people just don't think like that. People think they're going to live to the 70, 80. <coughs> and to think that actually, potentially, they could die in their 30s, that, I think that's the bridge they have to cross. Once they come across that bridge, they're kind of like, okay, well, let's prepare for what happens afterwards. <coughs> I just don't think people want to face up to it. And I don't know how you remedy that, apart from maybe talking about it more and bringing the conversation up more. Because the more the conversation brought up, the more people sort of the penny drops and they go, yeah, actually, there is something worth, I can do something worthwhile afterwards. Yeah, I think it's kind of like making it into a positive instead of looking at it as a negative. Exactly. And saying, well, actually, I could save up to nine lives by, by being a donor instead of thinking, well, I'm talking about the end of my life. <coughs> yeah, so... Yeah, I do think a lot of people don't relate to it until they have someone in that position need an organ. No, definitely. And, th and then everyone also wants to give. Um, I mean, actually, I, my best friend, he's been on, on a donor list for a long time, and she, her son would like to go on a donor list because they know me. Her husband, though, still says, no, no way, not a chance in hell. <laughs> Um, and I do think there are for some people that blockade or whatever you want to call it that does people just think about the end and removing organs and they think about what it's going to be like and maybe burial and religion comes into it as well. <coughs> um, it, it, I think, but I think for most people, most people are very positive about it, and it is just a case of telling them that positivity and creating it and. Knowing them what can be accomplished if they go through with it, and then hopefully they'll go on from there. And could John, could you expand a bit in terms of talking about the the perhaps the quality of your life pre versus post transplant? You said you're 20 years post transplant now. What in in terms of trying to get that message across to people? What has that transplant meant to you? That's a very hard question to ask, answer because it's not been fun for a lot of the time. Um, I'm, I am 20 years post transplant, but I've spent 15, 16 years where I was really not well at all. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I was really well, I was really well immediately post transplant. 
uh, struggling my thumbs, thinking what do I do next, and couldn't do the job, uh, and probably ended up getting infections, and that kind of snowballed into more infections. <coughs> um, I spent 15 years then trying to get to, to the bottom of it, through various ways, um, which was very frustrating. I mean, everyone basically telling you, you've had to try to find your to go away. Um, uh, you say, well, yeah, I've had the child plan. My lungs work, but this isn't what I had the child plan for. Now, though, actually, I'm kind of, I'm still not well, but I'm the best I've been most down over here in a long time. And actually, I'm actually starting to be able to enjoy my life. But the thing is, that even when at my worst, I have to sort of say, I'm still alive. And that was kind of the whole point of it. As long as you stay alive, there's always a chance you can get better, and then you can do what you want to do. So it's, for me, it's been very frustrating, but in the long term, I'm still here, and that's kind of the key point of it. Uh, um, so, yeah. <laughs> I know we know I'm very capable about going into detail about it, because like I have to say, there's been some really, really, really rough patches in 20 years. But um, I, I, still think, I still think those 20 years has been a positive, even though a lot of it has been incredibly frustrating. Thank you. And Catherine, <coughs> from, from your experience, um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the pre and post-transplant in, in your experience? Because obviously every individual transplant is completely unique. Yeah, it's really difficult because I didn't realise how poorly I was until I've seen myself better now. I thought, yes, all right, I need oxygen, yes, all right, but I was still plodding along. I think I just got so used to being poorly and having such low lung function that it became my norm. So then now, it's just unbelievable. The fact that I can do things, I can breathe, just, yeah, can't explain it. <laughs> so literally, I'm looking, now looking at going back to work and things, and I've started my swimming and personal training again, so... It's just unbelievable. My lung function's already back up to 90%. Wow. I don't even remember <laughs> when it was that high. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And Kim, how is it hearing st these stories for you? Are you, uh, I mean, can you talk us a bit about how it makes you feel? Oh, it's, I think it's brilliant. Um, just to, it's so positive. And when you are sat waiting for that call, uh, your life kind of does feel on hold. <coughs> you do just plod along. And <coughs> it's a case of getting used to each level of going down in, in decline in lung function or health. You get used to it and, uh, to a certain extent. And you forget what it's like to actually feel okay. Um, you get to a point where you can't remember the last day that you actually felt okay. And that you could say, actually, yeah, I'm fine, when someone asks you if you're okay, um, and actually genuinely mean that you're okay. But to, to hear that, is, it's just so positive. And I know it's not, it's not a cure. You are going to have another set of problems, um, some more than others, when you've had your new lungs, or organ, whatever organ. Um, but you are here, like John said, he's here. 20 years down the line, he's still here. Um, if I got another 20 years to see my children grow up, I would be a very happy person. And like John has, he's took it all on the chin, whatever problems he's had. He's took it on the chin, gone on with it, and he's still here now. So I think it's just, um, it is a miracle, I think, to be honest, to, to be able to <clears throat> be at the point in life where you feel like you're not sure uh, whether you'll be here to see your next birthday, uh, to see your children's next birthday, and then to hear stories of someone having up to 90% lung function six months after transplant. You know, I can't help but smile, even though I don't know Kat. It's brilliant, you know, because it, it is not nice um, just sat waiting for a second chance, you know, it's not nice. So it's, it's good to hear positive stories, yeah. Too, too many 
uh, transplants are overruled by the families, um, whether or not that that person has joined the organ donor <coughs> register. What would you say to the people who who do want to be an organ donor and maybe haven't had that conversation or haven't got around to, to joining the register? What what would you say to those people? I think there are, there are two two key issues, and firstly, it's getting people to sign up for the transplant and or organ donations, sorry, <coughs> um, and and that's like the first hurdle, but then I think it's so important to draw home to people. It's great you've signed up to be an organ donor, but you have to discuss it. Um, I mean, at the moment, the fact that families can still turn around and say, that well, actually, we don't agree with that, we don't want to go ahead. Um, I can prove where they're coming from, but surely it should be the person's wish of what they want to happen that, that is, takes precedence. Um, but at the moment, we are in this situation where the family can be to it if they want to. So it's just so important for fam for the person who signs up for the donor, donor, donor to discuss it with everyone. Um, a, so that when they finally do pass away, the, their wishes can be met. But B, to spread the word as well. Because um, let's face it, if they told their family, they might actually have, have a really open discussion about it. And not only would the family say, yes, okay, we see where you're coming from, we will do what you want. But they may also turn around and say, actually, we see where you're coming from, and we want to sign as well. Uh, so I think it's important from two points of view. <coughs> yeah, I agree with John. I do think it's really important to let your family know. And again, it comes back to the, if you know someone in that situation, because after my liver transplant, we had a party uh, to celebrate a year. And we had all the organ donor cards there, ready to sign up, and then we sent off all the forms. And the amount of people we got to sign up that day, because they'd seen me and seen the difference it had made. So I think there needs to be more people out there promoting it as well, so they can see what a difference they'll make if they choose to donate when they go. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I agree with that, definitely. It's, it's having that conversation, which again is that difficult thing to do um, you know we're used to, to thinking about that kind of thing um, and our families are used to thinking about that kind of thing but people that haven't got anything to do with anyone that's poorly or whatever they don't have to and it's easy to avoid that subject but um, the more publicity we can get to show you know like John and Kat and and what life is like for people <clears throat> that are waiting for transplants compared to after. It just makes complete sense. It's just getting that, like like Kat said, just to sign up and that simple little thing that takes two minutes, you know? It's uh, it's just a little thing, a little tiny thing. I think, as well, sorry, I, think I was just going to say as well, I think what people don't understand is they think, well, I'll leave it until... I'm faced with that situation, i.e. a friend or family member has died and I have to make a decision. And the trouble is, when you get to that situation, it is a very emotional decision and that emotion can override any kind of common sense <coughs> understanding or, or logic you may have. Uh, and you may make a very different decision after the fact than you do before. So I think for people it's so important to sit down and think about what do you want to happen afterwards? Yeah. Can I just say, I um, never even thought, even though I'm in my situation, I've got two children, and I never even considered for a second to put them on the, the donor list. And it just dawned on me one day, I'm like, why have I not put my children on there? It just doesn't make any sense. So even for me, it just hadn't registered in my mind to just do it and once I've done it I sign them straight up um, you know put a picture on my Facebook with the kids with the cards when they came through and but it just didn't occur to me to put my children on there because I'm so focused on on myself <clears throat> so I think you know it is it's just overlooked so much I think and yeah that's great and um, it's hope mm -hmm. we're hoping that the transplant games which are uh, 
going to be held in Liverpool at the end of this month. It's, I think it's the 28th to the 31st of July will help to raise some of these awareness and tell some of these stories. So just to finish off, and um, thank you for all of your time, can you tell us if you were thinking of competing in the Transplant Games, what, what would be your sport of choice? I was, I was actually meant to be competing this year for the first time, um, and then I've had three months being ill, so I've had to withdraw. Uh, but I was going to do the swimming events. That was kind of my main thing. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed for next year. Yeah, I'd be swimming as well. That would be my thing. I love swimming. I was desperate to get back to it after transplant, so... <laughs> I can't like to do anything. <laughs> Just anything. <laughs> Just to be able to do anything would be great. Well, well, we'll be keeping an eye on you all then as, uh, as they come up. Um, look, thank you all so much for sharing your stories um, and helping us raise awareness on this important okay. issue. We'll continue to, to fight and raise awareness. And uh, thank you all for your time. Many of us will have taken these tablets for minor injuries, but the dose required to treat inflammation in the lungs of a person with cystic fibrosis could cause serious side effects in the stomach. Researchers in Texas are investigating a way of delivering the drug